faithful sayings. We have had some of the onlyest kind of sayings, haven't we? For years and years and years, sayings that really have been passed down from generation to generation and they have some of them have been said so much and for such a long time that even though they're not true people believe them they believe them cleanliness is next to godliness church folk have been saying it for years and I want somebody to show me where that's at in the Bible. Amen. But people believe it. And if you ask some, they'll say, oh yeah, it's in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Amen. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It is right before the one that says Jesus wept. Because for people that believe that, it makes Jesus weep. Amen? <laughs> faithful sayings, faithful things, different sayings. Every culture has had them and has them. We call them truths. We call them cliches, possibly, or even proverbs. Uh, and some of them become folklore. They become infamous, if you will, over the years and are passed on from generation to generation. Some are told as true, but they really aren't. Let me give you an example. There's one that has always been said, and I've always heard it, and I'm sure you'll recognize this one as well. But there's a saying that says, what you don't know won't hurt you. <laughs> What you don't know won't hurt you. Guess what? What you don't know could possibly kill you. Amen. 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 Folks talking about what you don't know won't hurt you. You don't know somebody's around the corner right there getting ready to rob you. But it ain't going to hurt you. Don't even make sense, does it? What you don't know won't hurt you. That's not a, a truthful saying, is it? But we, we say it for whatever reason. I would imagine the main reason is somebody's been talking about that person and somebody just says, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. It will hurt you. Amen? Amen. Because what you don't know will hurt you. When you don't know what is written in that Bible will hurt you. You need to know what's written in that Bible. You need to know thus saith the Lord. If you're praying about healing you need to know what the Bible says about healing. And there is but one person that will every day, every moment, from generation to generation for eternity will tell you the absolute truth and that's God Almighty above. When He says it, it, it is true. Amen? Now, the writings of Paul is what the scripture text is for today. It's the writings of Paul to Timothy and Titus, who are both pastors. Uh, they would become pastors of the early church. And these things that Paul is writing to them, some of them could be considered sayings or possibly even proverbs. But everything that Paul is telling Timothy Everything that Paul is telling Titus is real and it is true. He is telling them what they must do, but he's also telling them what they must tell the people. Because in every culture, in every society, God has tried to reach people. And that's why I told you this morning that God's on the move. God is trying to reach us. 
God is trying to get a hold of us. God is trying to grab a hold of us. And God is going to baptize us in the Holy Ghost as a body of Christ. Every member having its function. And when every member of that body is baptized in the Holy Ghost and we come together as one baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will see another day of Pentecost at the Goldsboro Pentecostal Free Will Baptist Church because God is going to bless us. And when we do, then we're going to have the power to really do what God wants us to do. Uninhibited. Nothing able to get in the way because the baptism of the Holy Ghost is going to cover all of that. Amen. It's going to surpass all of that. It's going to outweigh all of that because I can promise you this. You get baptized in the Holy Ghost and God really gets a hold of you. You will not let nothing get in the way or you will not be hindered in any way from doing the work of the Lord. You will be motivated every day. You will be assured every day. You will be confident every day. And you will know that you are doing the work of the Lord. And for that, you will be blessed. How many of you want to be blessed this morning? Amen. I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed of God. I want to know that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do every day of my life. Not just every now and then. Glory be to God. I want to know that I am carrying out the will, the plan, the purpose and the vision of God for this church and for my own life, for my family, amen, for my family's sake, for generations to come. The things that we say impact people's lives and we've got to make sure that they're true, that they're real and that they are right. Amen. So what does Paul say? What should we learn? What what should we accept? Because if there's anything we need to accept, church, we need to accept the living Word of God. Now, sometimes that Word is going to cut us, isn't it? It's going to cut deep because God is trying to do something in us and for us, by us and through us. And so sometimes it's going to cut, but we need to accept that. We need to accept it when God... God convicts, convicts us and even rejoice in it. Because what does the Bible say? That conviction is proof positive that God's Holy Spirit is in you to begin with. And you can rejoice in that. Amen. If it weren't, then you'd have to really question your salvation. All right. 1 Timothy 1 and 15, the, the very first scripture that I gave. Jesus came, church, to save sinners. That's his purpose. That's why he came. Amen. He came to save sinners. A portion of 1 Timothy 1 and 15 says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then what does he say? Of whom I am the worst. He says, I am chief. Amen. All of us have been there. In some way, shape, form, and or fashion, we were just like Paul before Christ Jesus. Amen. We were lost and undone. Jesus came for you. But He also came for the person sitting next to you. He also came for the person sitting in front of you, sitting behind you. He also came for those that the Lord is going to bring to our church that walk through that door, that have never been here before, that we've never seen before. God saved, God saved them as well. Jesus came for them as well. The Word of God, church, and this is what I love about the Bible. This is what I love about the Word of God is it actually can breathe life into you. You can read the newspaper and it'll take life out of you. It'll, it'll suck life out of you. It'll make you depressed. Amen? But the Word of God doesn't do that. 
The Word of God won't depress you. The Word of God will change and transform your life. It will breathe life into you. That is why I am so tenacious about making sure at every possible opportunity that I am telling you read your Bible every day. Get to a place where it's just you and the Lord and read your Bible. It is those times that God moves on you. It is those moments that God is speaking to you and to you alone. Why? Because Jesus came to save sinners. Aren't you glad today that He came to save you? He came to save bad sinners. I don't think I ever heard of a good sinner. Amen. He came to save bad sinners, but also the self-righteous who all already thought or still think that they're good enough to make it to heaven. There are people that still think that if they are just good enough, if they, if they work hard and if they provide for their family, if they don't, they don't get in any trouble with the law and they mind their own business and they get involved with some community activity that somehow, some way, just because they believe in God, that God is going to save them. That's contrary to what the Bible says, amen, in regard to salvation and what one must do to be saved. Uh, Jesus is the way, church, amen, for all lost to find their way to God. For everybody that is lost to find their way to God. And I think everybody deserves that, don't you? I think everybody deserves that chance. I think everybody deserves that opportunity to get their lives right and straight with God. Now all of us, as Paul, were the worst of sinners and, and God's mercy was given for us to be saved, wasn't it? God showed His mercy towards us, didn't He? God shined His grace down and His mercy down upon our lives. God lets us be examples so that others can, can too have hope and, and put their faith in Jesus Christ. God saved us that others could see that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And when people look at us and people see us, they say, my goodness, if God did that for them... If God did that for them, then maybe, just maybe, there's hope for me. There's hope for me. Uh, if some of you, if, if, if some of us could be saved, uh, imagine what good we could do for God. Number two, godliness has a worldwide effect. That's why we're involved in missions. That's why we give to missions. That's why we help missions and we want to help missionaries. People like uh, Brother Joseph Benigno and Brother Nick Sakat and Brother Doc Hobbs, our World Witness Director. That's why we have a World Witness Department because the gospel of Jesus Christ and godliness has a worldwide effect. We we can affect and we can impact the lives of people all over the world with the message of Jesus Christ. Because I do believe this. I believe the message of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, I know this. The message of Jesus Christ is really the only true way to God. The only true way. And we can have a worldwide effect through our godliness. Amen? We need to exercise ourselves towards godliness. Paul uh, writes that, that bodily exercise profits a little. It is, is good for your body. 
But what about our spiritual exercise? What about the exercise that we are carrying about in our spirit selves, in our spirit man, in our spirit woman? It is the growth that we should have in be being closer and growing closer to God. Your spiritual fitness, your spiritual maturity has an effect, church, on other people. When we act immature, when we act ungodly, when people see us acting ungodly, when they hear us acting ungodly, it has just the opposite effect, doesn't it? It has a negative effect. Now the truth is this. We can't help the world with physical exercise. The church. Okay? But we can help the world with godliness. We can help people through our own godliness and through our own relationships with God. Because if your relationship with God is right, then you are going to help other people. You are going to want to help other people. We can be, church, water to the thirsty. Amen? We can be bread to the hungry. We can be light in the darkness. We can be that salt which helps to purify. We can be, be that love that brings a peace to someone's life. You know the peace I'm talking about. When you lay your head down at night and you know without a doubt that things are right between you and God. Uh, and lastly, we are to be fire. We are to be a fire to a cold world to bring warmth. The Holy Spirit in us is that fire. It's that fire that moves us and makes us do what we do. It is that fire. You might not have felt that fire when you got up this morning, but you still got up and you got yourself ready and you came to church, glory be to God, because you want to worship the Lord and you want to be with other believers and you want to learn of Jesus. You want to get, if you will, your fix with the Lord. You just want to touch the woman with the issue of blood. After every resource had been exhausted, she came to the place that she thought, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, because she too had heard this man named Jesus. She had heard that he was coming. She had heard that he was coming to town. Glory be to God. And so she began to think within herself and a hope began to well up inside of her to the point that she thought, if I can but touch, if I can but touch, how many of you today just need to touch Jesus and you just need Jesus to touch you? I need a touch from the Lord. Glory be to God. I need a touch from the Lord just like you need a touch from the Lord. And when He touches us, we are that fire to a world out there that's absolutely cold to Christ. Amen? There are those who persevere. And I'm telling you today, church, in the scripture text is 2 Timothy chapter 2. Those who persevere will reap the reward. How many of you want your reward? The Bible promises that, doesn't it? That we will reap a reward. You can trust the Lord. And the key is this. This is the key now. If you lose your life for Jesus, then you gain true life. What kind of life? Eternal life. But you've got to lose your life. You've got to lose what you want 
It's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's not about what my flesh wants. It's not about what your flesh wants. It is about what the Lord wants. And if you will lose your life for Jesus, then what you will actually do is gain your life and you will gain a life that is beyond compare. You will gain a life that is blessed and highly favored as Sister Barbara says we are blessed and highly favored because we lose our lives. God gives us a life. He changes us. We, don't, we didn't get saved to have the same life that we had before, did we? We didn't get saved to be the same person we were before. We needed to change. And we knew we needed to change. And so we had to let go of that life. And we still have to let go of it in serving the Lord. Amen. And what about if you disown the Lord? Well, let me put it this way. If you disown the Lord, don't grumble when He disowns you before His Father. When you deny Christ, and when I say deny Christ, I'm not always talking in a verbal sense. I mean when you deny Him by your actions and by the life that you're living. When you say, oh, I, I love my neighbor as myself, but yet you won't love your neighbor. You are disowning Jesus. Uh, the message of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's go to verse 11, David. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also what? Live with him. Uh, if we died with Him, then we will also live with Him. And this life, church, is going to be for an eternity. We are going to live with the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. There's not going to be any more crying. There's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more worrying. There's not going to be any more troubles. Glory be to God. You are going to live with Him for an eternity. Glory to God. You are going to be able to be with Him and worship Him and magnify Him and glorify Him every day of your life. Praise be unto God. God Almighty above. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because we died with Him. Number four. So put your faith to work. Number four. Real salvation is best revealed in a transformed life. Titus chapter 3 in verse 8 is a faithful saying, church. Real salvation is best revealed in a transformed life. This is a trustworthy saying. Anytime Scripture begins by saying that, what God is saying is you can count on this. I will never waver from it. I will not let you down. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Not just things that are profitable to just a few, but profitable to everyone. You see, what matters is the entire body of Christ, not just one part of it, not just one portion. We need the entire body of Christ fed with the living Word of God, sold out to Jesus 100%, taking up their own crosses and baptized in the Holy Ghost to come together as one. Glory be to God. And that will profit everyone. Amen. Paul has already instructed Titus about the way senior men and women or to be an example to the younger men and women. 
There are six things, church, that are our public duty as Christians, all right, to be good citizens. That is, we are to be law-abiding. Amen? We are to be active in service. We are to be careful in speech. We are to be tolerant of others. Amen? That's something we can work on. We are to be kind. And we are to be gentle. Anything contrary to that, I believe would bring back the old man, the old woman. Amen? Amen? And all that is supposed to be set aside, done away with. Amen? So we don't want to bring that back. We don't want to bring that old man back. We don't want to bring that old woman back. We don't want to bring that old person back. Our old selves. We're new creatures in Christ. we got to act like it. And that's what Paul is telling Titus. He says, you've got to tell them this. You've got to tell them and teach them how they are to be and how they are to live. Law abiding, active in service, careful in speech. Watch what you say. You might end up regretting it. Tolerant of others. Tolerant. We forget. It's too easy for us to forget that at one point in time in our life, somebody put up with us. Amen. Somebody put up with me. Somebody put up with that old man that I used to be in those old ways. They were tolerant of me. And we might not agree with everything that everybody does. And we don't have to agree with it. But we do need to be tolerant of it. Long-suffering, the Bible talks about. Amen? We need to pray for them. Somebody might not be living just like we think they ought to live. You don't know the circumstances. You don't really know what somebody is going through always, church. Be tolerant. Be understanding. Show some grace and some mercy and some love. Be kind and be gentle. In other words, don't be the person you were before Jesus. Don't be that person. Paul actually teaches how Titus, as a minister, was to be hard on those who were willing to do the opposite. He was to be hard on them. In other words, he wasn't supposed to take any junk off of them. Amen? Sometimes as a minister, you have to tell people difficult things. Sometimes you have to be hard on them, but in a loving way. And you do it because you do love them. And you do it because it's about the whole body, not just a part of the body. See, when I'm asking God for direction, when I'm trying to carry out the vision of God, when I'm meeting with deacons and when we are planning, when we are working on things, we have to consider and I have to consider the entire body. I can't consider just one part of that because what we do affects everybody. Amen? Are you with me this morning? Because it is to help you grow stronger in your faith. God wants you to grow stronger in your faith. Amen? An example, you speak poorly of another Christian or you show favoritism or you, you perhaps hurt or insult somebody. I promise you this, if I find out about it, I'm going to be hard on you. I'm going to ask you why. I'm going to ask what's the problem. Because it's unacceptable. And it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Let me finish. Titus 3, verses 4 through 8. I think I had them on there, David. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared... 
He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His what? Mercy. He saved us through the washing of the rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We were reborn. Amen? Whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Isn't that what we want? This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing